Welcome to the latest video in the series Greenwich Detective Fiction. Although this is the latest video as of the 21st of September 2020, it's designed to go alongside the three videos on Edgar Allan Poe's Murders in the Rue Morgue, which have been up on YouTube for some time now. Originally, we taught another story by Poe, which wasn't obviously a detective story, but it did highlight the reader as detective who has to look for clues to make sense of the text. We decided in the end, though, that this story, the very famous The Pit and the Pendulum, approached the topic of reader as detective too obliquely. And that's why we decided to replace it with a story, the Red Silk Scarf, more obviously involving a detective, and yet, which is all about reading as detection, and the games that texts play with readers, and that many of us readers very willingly enter into. Now, in what follows, I'm assuming you've already watched the first three videos and know the six key terms, along with that absolutely fundamental other term, discourse. Now, overall, Greenwich Detective Fiction and literature and publishing that it's part of seeks to be very coherent and to build on preceding elements. That means that we revisit different aspects of the same issues again and again in different guises and in different ways. And it's quite likely that you may get unstuck if you dive into a later video without having watched and noted the previous one. At least the meanings of the key terms is something that you really do need to get to grips with. Now, I'm not going to repeat what I've said before, and none of the later videos are self-standing. You really do need to follow the whole course through. Rather than to repeat the definitions then, what I'm going to do is give a very quick overview of the author of The Red Silk Scarf and his most famous creation, Arsène Lupin, The Charming Rascal, and the predecessor of so many 20th century figures who stay just beyond the law. Now, I do think it's a good place to start with the past, even if I'm not going to repeat myself. And we saw in the third video on the murders in the Rue Morgue how it's all too easy to take for granted, just not to see the terrible violence of the discourses that support the assumptions behind the story. We're asked to pity the sailor who's lost his imperial prize, not the women or the animal, all of whom are silenced, while the detective, the narrator, the sailor, and the male-controlled press are all given ample space and the dominant voice, the voice that controls the reality of the mystery, the discourses that contain it, is that of the masculinist, imperialist, sexist detective. Straight away, if you've watched those three videos, you'll have spotted that much the same sexist narration is legible in The Red Silk Scarf. We never get to hear the murdered woman. We are never asked to pity her. She's an object in the plot and no more, like the scarf. We are just asked to laugh at the stupid detective who can't read all the clues. Even while he thinks he's being clever, he's actually being led into an entirely false path, just as we are. Students always get the sexism of the story. We have by now been so well trained in the discourses of feminism that we can follow its implications if we're alerted just once in passing to the idea that sexism is something we need to look out for. And it's because of its obviousness that I'm not planning to go down that route here in this video. I'm not denying its importance at all, on the contrary. It's just that once we're alerted to it, we can see it without my help. What I do want to focus on is something that, in my experience, students are much less alert to. One of the key aspects is the word time. Form is fundamental. And that's why I want to focus on form. But before we get to think about form and how it plays with how we feel, with how form affects us. Let's have a quick look at Maurice Leblanc and Arsène Lupin, as they, unlike Poe, are much less familiar to students, though they are very famous in France, Japan, and elsewhere 
around the world. The author of The Red Silk Scarf, Maurice Leblanc, was born in the provinces in 1864. That is the year when Mary Braddon was publishing the next text on this course, Henry Dunbar. He tried to train as a lawyer, but dropped out of law school before moving to Paris and trying to earn a living by writing. So far, this is such a typical life story of 19th century male writers. Born in the provinces, try to go into the law, fail, go into writing, move to the capital city. In Paris, Maurice Leblanc did manage to make ends meet by his writing, but no more. He wrote in a style that owed a great deal to Flaubert, detailed, realistic, modern, aesthetic. He just didn't have Flaubert's success. And by 1905, when he was 41, he was asked by a friend, the editor of a new magazine, to contribute to this new monthly. It was called Je Sais Tout. I know everything. It seems rather a pompous title, and the English Wikipedia page about it defines it as a popular science magazine. And on one reading, its logo of a Mr. Gentleman world cogitating may lead you to expect that until you think about, well, does he really know what he's talking about? For in fact, Je Sais Tout was set up as a fun magazine for the middle classes. It covered a lot of ground from fashion to politics, from the theatre and the latest books to uh, the latest fiction itself included in its pages. I know everything, as opposed to I know everything. Well, you can see this, I think, in the elegant family eagerly listening to the telephone on the cover of the first issue. The magazine is like a friend ringing you up to tell you of the latest news you really need to know. Well, the magazine, as you can see from that family, is absolutely middle of the road. It's mass market. There's something for everyone who's middle class or aspiring to be middle class. Anyway, Maurice Leblanc's tale, The Arrest of Arsène Lupin, turned out to be a huge success. The circulation of Je Sais Tout rose enormously because of it. And as a result, Leblanc continued to write Arsène Lupin novels and short stories until his death in 1941. Many of them for the magazine where he made his name and later on for other magazines too. Arsène Lupin is considered the French equivalent to Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, though they are, to me, actually more self-conscious, knowing they're amused and very, very amusing. And I think you'll get the character of the Arsène Lupin stories when I tell you that there are even a few adventures where Arsène Lupin meets Sherlock Holmes. Get it? Leblanc couldn't use the name Sherlock Holmes because of copyright reasons, but he came as close as he could. Leblanc claimed that when he had started to write the Arsène Lupin adventures, he didn't know the Conan Doyle stories. He claimed he was instead influenced by Edgar Allan Poe, who was very fashionable and had a high status in France in the late 19th century, early 20th. And of course, as I pointed out, we can see a similar sexual ideology at play in the Red Cell Scarf to what we find in Poe. If there's one takeaway from this tiny potted biography, it's that Maurice Leblanc discovered his USP, his unique selling proposition. He made a lot of money out of it and he stuck to it. In this sense, he's not just like Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes, but also, and I think actually more similar to Raymond Chandler, who we'll be studying later. Chandler started out publishing poetry but found his niche writing hard-boiled detective fiction. In publishing, art rarely pays as well as genre fiction, unless there are other factors involved. I'm sure you know all about that. But that said, 
we do have to find out exactly what we're really good at, not what we think we want to do or what we think we're good at. Leblanc thought he wanted to write and was good at writing art fiction. Instead, he was brilliant at writing detective stories. At least he found that out. He may have been 41, but he did find it out. Key to the success of Leblanc and his creation were the many adaptations of his stories. And we'll say again and again over this course how literature and publishing are very closely tied into what are called transmedia practices. In the 19th century, this was mainly a linkage of print publishing and the theatre, though art, fashion, and even ceramics were also important. In the 20th century, film and television assume the ascendant. And here we find on the left a publicity still from a 2004 French film starring, besides Romain Duris, as the dashing Arsène Lupin, no less than Eva Green and Kristen Scott Thomas. Maurice Leblanc himself co-wrote the first Arsène Lupin play in 1908, and on the right is an advert for it. The play came to London and it even went to Broadway. And the following quotation from the theatrical newspaper of the era is especially interesting for showing how a character can take on a life of its own, just as, of course, Sherlock Holmes has in the English-speaking world. First of all, as we can see, Leblanc worked with a French collaborator on the play, and then he worked with an English-speaking collaborator on the novelization of the play, which was timed to come out with the opening of the performances in London. And look at the publisher, Mills and Boone. Gerald Rusgrove Mills and Charles Boone had just then started as a publisher, well, just the year before. They were at this time a general fiction publisher, not a specialist in romances aimed at women that they turned into in the 1930s. In the case of Arsène Lupin, the novel and play, it's clear that Mills and Boone are making an investment which they think will be secure. The novel has got multiple possibilities for advertising that a joint theatrical and novel launch will just bring. By the way, I should also say there are lots of Arsène Lupin films, though very few in English. And the earliest dates from 1908, when the French original of the play was first put on. So what Mills and Boone were doing in publishing uh, this novel, novelization of a play, was really secure. Arsène Lupin was what's called in the industry already pre-sold. Again, I stress, literature and publishing isn't just about printed words. Underlying the whole idea of literature and publishing is a much wider leisure industry comprising a host of transmedia practices that, if all goes as it's supposed to, work synergistically together. Now, it won't surprise you that Arsène Lupin spreads far beyond popular mass market entertainment. He has a journal and an association dedicated to him. There is a whole Arsène Lupin industry, which has even generated several biographies of this fictional figure, uh, which are based on the Leblanc text. Just think Doctor Who, Sherlock Holmes, and many other characters who encapsulate such powerful archetypes, or as I prefer to think of it, focus discourses we consider central to who we are, archetypes or foci that escape the control of any one person or any one part of the in entertainment industry. In short then, even if you haven't heard of him, Arsène Lupin is a major player on the world stage of detective fiction. He's an icon of world detective fiction. Now, that's quite enough on Leblanc and his creation. I've established their importance, and that's enough. What's really key to this session, as I've said before, is the idea 
that detective fiction typically plays with time. It does this in various ways, as we'll see. But what I want to stress in this video is form and how it makes us feel. Now, I've already defined form as the ordered succession of words in time. Typically, this is top to bottom, left to right on a page. And that applies whether we read on a screen or in paper format. It seems very obvious, but of course it's not. And at the risk of repeating myself, I want to go back to a few slides from a previous video just to emphasize the importance of what I'm saying here. That's because so many students, I've said, don't take into account what it means to unpick the ordered succession of words in time. Now, it seems very dry, but in fact, this ordered succession of words in time has very distinct and even powerful emotional effects, as I'm just going to try to explain. Now, for a long time, it's been acknowledged that this ordered succession of words in time is fundamental to textual analysis. The difference between plot and story, which I'm sure you all know by now, is just one aspect of that idea of ordered succession of words in time. Now, if you aren't sure or can't remember the difference between plot and story, just pause at this point in the video and think about what you can see on the screen. In detective fiction, what's really important is the difference between the two. Form for the purposes of this section of the course can be considered more or less the same as plot. Plot is an ordering of time through words in a particular way to create particular emotional and epistemological effects. One of the other key words is, of course, game. The plot of the text plays a game with us, telling us some things, keeping back others, leading us up the garden path, perhaps, or along Paris streets, so that our perspective is prevented from seeing the whole. Detective fiction plays a game of hide-and-seek, if you like. We anticipate that at the end, we shall find the answer, see the whole, resolve the mystery, find who done it, find the person. And that game is structured in time, just as in hide-and-seek. Finding the hidden person straight away is no fun, of course. They just weren't trying. They aren't playing properly, we think. They aren't following the rules which demand you have to try not to be found. And yet, in the end, ensure you are. And what the red silk scarf does so brilliantly is expose the structure of the game for us. It lays out before us how detective fiction works. It gives us enormous pleasure and exposes the process of the game and in that, in turn, gives us enormous pleasure. The story constantly wrong-foots us by making us think we've found the answer all too easily and then showing us that what we've found is not the answer but a deeper mystery after all. As I'll uh, explain in a few minutes, it plays with the classical concepts of anagnoresis, recognition, and peripatia, change of circumstances or change of mind, or in fact, it's a change of argument in rhetoric. And it puts these on display. It puts on display the elements of form through which we draw conclusions. And that's why we decided to put the red silk scarf on the course, in fact, because it displays everything so very clearly. As you'd expect, the story is very carefully organised, and that's what I'm going to turn to first. Then, since this is, again, another thing that students need help with, I'll offer a close reading of small sections of the introduction and the exposition to suggest some of the emotional effects of form. But first then, let's have a look at the structure of the whole story. Now, I strongly suggest that if you don't have a copy of the story of the red silk scarf in front of you now, a 
copy that you can annotate, you should pause this video and get hold of a copy so that you can mark up the relevant points. It really will be much easier for you to follow my argument if you've got the text in front of you. Now, you'll see that I've split the screen up into three columns. The first element indicates the larger structural element of the story, so it's the larger developments, the larger divisions, rather, that I'll be focusing on here. And then I'll mark where those elements begin and end. I'll give the first and last words. In the third and final column, I'll note who the characters are and how the element forwards the plot in some way, or contributes to it, perhaps, rather than forwards. It's easier to understand this in action, as it were, and so without further ado, I'll launch in. First, we have an introduction where the shabby man with the straw hat in December and the boy writing mysterious symbols on walls leads us and Chief Inspector Ganima to Lupin. It's all very silly, very obviously a setup, and sets the tone for the whole. It's very clearly a game that's being played between men. I'll comment more on this in a later section of this video, when we start to read short passages closely and also a bit before. But the important thing I want you to note here, as a general point, is something a bit different. And that's the importance of actions, the importance of verbs in demarcating structural elements in this story. Leblanc really does make it very easy indeed for us to analyse this story structurally. Leaving suggests a new beginning, and shutting doors suggests an end or the beginning of a new phase in a story. In both cases, also notice, the verb indicates a change in the focalizer's relationship to space. The verb indicates a change in the focalizer's relationship to space. Yes, you did hear that twice because it's so important. Now, in that sense, the structural elements that I'm referring to here are like scenes in the theatre or in a film. Now, the second element comprises the exposition. It's in two very clearly demarcated parts, again organised by a change in spatial arrangement. Here they are. The first comprises the conversation between Ganimard and Lupin, which they conduct standing up. It's fundamentally an exchange that establishes the relationship between the two. Or, if we've read previous stories in which they appear, a reminder of and a riff on the characteristics of that relationship. I think what we can see very clearly, what we're supposed to see, is Lupin's command of verbal space. Ganimard, by contrast, can only utter a couple of brief insults and a couple of feeble attempts to put Lupin down. But then Lupin promises that he will start at once and offers Ganimard a cigar. And here's the change of spatial arrangement. Sits down. Exposition B marks the second part, and indeed it's the exposition proper. Here, the mystery is set out for us, including some of the evidence. What Lupin is doing, especially in the last paragraph, where Lupin rose from his chair, again, note change in spatial arrangements to emphasise the importance of what's happening here. What Lupin is doing is setting up the course of the actions he wants Ganimard to take. He's setting up the story. Lupin is, in a way, like the author. I'm buried in the middle of that paragraph, so we won't notice it too much. It's just another detail that the narrator and Lupin want us to forget and only remember at the important time is the piece of the scarf that Lupin keeps. Very clever, in the middle of a paragraph, buried away. Remember that technique if you want to then return to something to surprise the reader. Finally, there is a transition which details the effects of the conversation on Ganima. 
Lupin leaves all of a sudden, and Ganimard is left alone in a room he finds has been locked. He manages to escape with effort, and the emotional effects of the conversation are detailed. We come to the end of the introduction and exposition taken as a whole with a decision, a conclusion. That's all swank, a parcel of suppositions and guesswork based upon nothing at all. I am not to be caught with chaff, thinks Ganimard. The mystery seems closed down. Well, we know it isn't, of course, as we can see that there are several pages yet to go in the story. But Ganimard's assertion is a very clear marker of the closure of this structural unit. It's a temporary conclusion. It's a hypothesis that is going to be tested pretty soon, in fact. Now, already you can see how very clear, how very obvious the structure of the game is. How very clearly the ordered succession of words in time is laid out. Now, it's certainly possible to divide the story up differently. Not too differently, I think. I think we'd be arguing about details. For example, to me, the two paragraphs immediately before the exposition, that I, what I've marked as the exposition here, I am sorry, what I've previously said can, was the beginning of the exposition, can be regarded as a transition between the introduction and the exposition. Lupin comes in and dismisses his accomplices. I chose not to mention that transition, as to me it's a detail. Of course it's important, it's great for style, but it's not a major structural unit, and it's the major structural units, the major structural elements that I'm focusing on in this analysis here. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the elements in all the following slides in detail. You can follow them in your copies of the story, but I will remind you that, of course, after the exposition, we get development of a plot. The development of a plot is divided into several stages. It's several acts, if you like. And within each act or within each development, there are sections. Here you can see development A1, where we find the fellow detective um, back in the police headquarters, and Ganimard has partial confirmation of what he's just heard. And within each section, or rather, each section is marked by physical rearrangement of some sort. In the first, in development A1, we follow Ganimard to police headquarters. Then we go to the scene of the crime, I've given you all here, where the victim acquires a body and a name, or rather a stage name, an artificial name, based on the fact that she has a valuable sapphire. As I've said already, she's nothing more than a carrier of valuables that men steal. The key to the discovery of the sapphire is given here. She's clutching onto it with both hands as if to protect herself. Well, she's clutching on to what defines her, the sapphire, her means of survival. The insensitive police don't realize that. Hegemonic masculinity is so stupid, it doesn't twig. Rather, and this takes us to the next section, where Ganimard's boss takes him aside, note the physical rearrangement, for a man-to-man -man conversation. Masculinity is really key in this story. It's something that's often forgotten in gender analyses. But really here, uh, it's masculinity rather than the nature of femininity that's at stake. Now, both these policemen, we discover, are under pressure to be seen to perform. Their masculine identities, their value to society, seems to depend on successful performance of their jobs. And note that masculinity is another aspect of gender. I stress this again, that students too often overlook, not just in their discussion of this story, but in discussions of others as well. In fact, it's in order to be seen to be successful, that Ganimard is finally forced to recognize the value of Lupin's story. This development constitutes his anagnoresis. 
the technical term for recognition, recognition of reality. And recognition of his situation and what he must do leads to what is called a peripatia, a shift in circumstance or change of mind. And we see the three elements of development A leading up to this anagnoresis and peripatia. If you're not entirely sure what those are, have a look at that particular end element of the story. Just refer back to the story. It's really very obvious when you look at it. Now, I'm going to go over this structural analysis even more quickly than the previous. I suggest you pause now to read the screen. In fact, I'm putting everything up. What I do want to ask is whether you're seeing a pattern here. Three parts to a development followed by a peripatia. It's very clearly, very artificially, very knowingly constructed. It doesn't seek to conceal its construction, but to flaunt it. I stress, I've said that before, I'm saying it again. Just look at how beautifully balanced all the elements are, the structural units. I'll, I suggest you pause. I'm now going to move on to the next screen. If you haven't read this before, just stop. Development C is the shortest one. It's all about Ganimard's struggle to recognize that he has to give in to the story that Lupin has set up for him. Yet again, it's as if Lupin is kind of God and <laughs> Ganimard is a, a human being who has to recognize that God's preordained everything for us. Look at the careful structure, which again is a duplicate of the preceding. The three sections of the development are all organized like this, and that's what makes this story so very easy to read. Again, I suggest you pause and read the screen, because I'm now going to move on to the last. Again, note the structure. It's the fifth slide of this kind. And by now, you'll almost certainly have guessed that the structure of the short story is very, very carefully organized. I've said that before. I hope I've given you the proof. And in many ways, it's organized like a five-act play, except that the fifth act here is the climax rather than the conclusion. The conclusion comprises just a short letter by Lupin that's delivered to Ganimard by one of the latter's detectives, <laughs> the ultimate insult. And uh, one that we'll see again when we come to Richard Marsh's Matched and Conan Doyle's A Scandal in Bohemia. Now, again, I'm not going to go over the screen in detail, as when you start thinking in structural terms, in terms of what the ordered succession of words in time might be, it's pretty clear. Just imagine if the story had been organised differently. What impression would we have had if Ganimard had entered the old manor house the first time with his revolver loaded, having taken his men with him to surround the house. Of course, there would have been no plot, or the plot would have been very, very different. Or imagine telling the story from Lupin's point of view. It would be rather dull, wouldn't it? There'd be no hide and seek, for even if the events might remain the same in, uh, in chronological order, we'd know the plan straight away. And it's the discovery of the plan that's uh, actually the mystery of this story. It's not the murder. It is the plan to recover or steal the sapphire. Now, despite its formal perfection and its debunking of orthodox masculinity that's keen to display its muscle, its a masculinity that's keen to show, to perform masculinity in public, which I, which I think is very funny. There is a lot that troubles me about the story. Of course, there's the position of the murder victim who is reduced, as I've said, to what she owned. She's named after her sapphire. She is, the story's not interested in what she was. The story's not interested really in her life story. It's irrelevant to the plot. We know that. Students always get that. But then I also wonder how reliable 
Lupin is, for the structure does not close down all mysteries despite its perfection, its, despite its rigour. Was Lupin's story of how he came by the evidence from the sand actually true? Given his clever storytelling, it may well not be. Maybe, and this will horrify fans of Arsène Lupin who regard him as the perfect gentleman thief who wouldn't murder or steal unjustly. Maybe Arsène Lupin murdered Jenny Sapphire and set up Thomas de Roeck, alias Monsieur Prévaille, as the fall guy. After all, Thomas did seem to have an alibi, whereas Lupin does not. Ganimard has the evidence, it's true, and this may well convict Thomas de Roeck, and in that sense, publicly, Ganimard will triumph. But are we 100% sure that justice is being done? In other words, despite the extraordinary stricture strictness of the structure, what makes the story so easy and such a pleasure to read? There are many questions that escape that structure. And perhaps it's the interplay of control and freedom, rigorous form and unpredictability of reading that generates our pleasure. We are like Ganima, who is, at the end, both defeated and successful. Things are not really closed down, but open themselves to other questions. Now, let's have a close read of some passages from the story to explore how the red silk scarf is constructed on a microscopic level and how it raises these tricky questions. I'm only going to look at passages from the introduction and exposition precisely because I want to see how far we as readers are figured in the text by Ganimard and what emotions are explored or incited in us as suspicious readers by the very form of the story. First of all, we're put in the position of the detective, Chief Inspector Ganimard, the detective who had arrested Lupin in the very first Lupin story and who's a recurring character. In this story, we're confined to his perspective. He is what narratology calls the focalizer. His actions mirror those of the reader very closely throughout. Just in this paragraph, he leaves his house, just as we are leaving our world to enter the genre of detective fiction. He's going to the law courts to see justice done, just as we expect to do in the world of detective fiction. But that move towards the spectacle of the law being upheld is interrupted, all in the first sentence, by the detective focalizers, our curiosity, something's not right. A man is not only wearing a straw hat, the kind of hat worn in summer, and he's wearing it in December, but he keeps stopping to literally drop a clue, a little piece of orange peel in this case. Now, we know from our experience of the detective fiction genre that we must be suspicious. We must read symptomatically, looking for symptoms, just as Chief Inspector Ganima is suspicious and reads society. He reads the world looking for social illness, looking for symptoms of social illness. Both he and we have been trained to read suspiciously. Now, look at the author's reflection on the shabby man's behaviour. Most people wouldn't pay it any attention, he thinks, and would dismiss it as childish or eccentric. But clever people like Ganima and like us, no better than that. We are shrewd observers. An observation, don't forget, is a key practice of Sherlock Holmes's, as you'll read in A Scandal in Bohemia. Don't tell me that Leblanc hadn't read, by this stage at least, the Sherlock Holmes stories. We, like Ganimard, are flattered. We're not like ordinary people. We have a spiritual impulse to find out the truth. In other words, the text flatters us. Of course, thus flattered, we want to go on and 
follow the trail to prove how wonderful we are. The next paragraph, and do note the careful use of paragraphing in this story in general, the chief inspector and we see the shabby man explaining, exchanging sorry, signals with a boy who in turn writes mysterious symbols on walls. Clue piles upon clue. It's getting rather exciting. What does the writing mean? As the chief inspector thinks, getting rather excited himself. What on earth can those two merchants be plotting? It won't surprise those of you who know me, but I'll pay very careful attention to these specific clues. It doesn't matter to me that plots and merchants may be poor translations from the French or what the French original was. But what I want to suggest is that here we have an even more obvious and indeed knowingly camp reflection on the commercial nature of the game that Leblanc, the publishers, the chief inspector and the two suspicious characters, the merchants, are all playing with their plots. It doesn't take us long to realise that Ganimard and we are being led up the garden path, or as I've said before, through a very clace, a clearly traceable route through Paris. The streets are all real, by the way, and the route is perfectly feasible and sensible. We're led through these streets up the garden path, only to be deceived of ourselves delivered into a more complicated plot than we'd been led to believe by the apparent realism of the journey through Paris. For plotting is what merchants do. At this point, I like to take my own experience of reading and researching and interpret the comments on merchants plotting as a reflection on the commercial nature of what we are experiencing, the plot of a story. This is not art for art's sake, Leblanc seems to be saying. This is plot for money's sake. Plot that I am selling and making a good deal of money from, thank you very much. As we eventually find out, the shabby man and the boy earn a hundred francs for leading us through the streets of Paris, away from the law courts. Note, not bad for a quick morning's work. Lupin as soon as he appears, really does suggest that he's a figure for the playful narrator. Lupin has written the introduction, as it were, set up the journey through Paris, and now it's he who is setting up the more complicated and deeper plot. If I'd written or telephoned, he said, you wouldn't have come, if I'd used some conventional means, in other words. Or, alternatively, if you had come, you'd have come with the regiment and arrested me. You'd have stopped me. I've stolen these ideas. These ideas that I'm recycling and selling to you are not entirely original, you know. Maybe I'm a swindler. Who is speaking here, I wonder? Is it Leblanc? Or is it Arsène Lupin? Not entirely clear, is it? When Arsène Lupin starts explaining the plot and involving Ganimard into the plot, he begins by giving the beginnings of history lessons, as if from stodgy guidebooks. It's very distracting and amusing, and that's just a red herring we and Ganimard think. It's easy to dismiss. It's just silly, superfluous detail that wastes words that we don't give a hang about. It's the reader, like Ganimard, is in a hurry to get to the nub of things. Yet, as we shall see, the questions of where the crime begins and who's really responsible for it is one of the preoccupations of detective fiction. We see this inquiry in Henry Dunbar. Who's responsible for that murder, really? We see it in a scandal in Bohemia. What exactly is the crime here? We see it in Matched, in The Lady in the Lake, and indeed with all the texts on this course. Leblanc and Lupin are playing with us and with Ganimard. They are 
starting to get us to think and playing with the notion and then dismissing who is ultimately responsible, who is the original criminal, to who we need to go back to Adam and Eve. In Lupin's case, it's easy to argue that he's a criminal because his father was a swindler, that is, of course, if we know his biography. And poor, poor little Lupin had to make ends meet very early in life and had no other model. But is it really necessary to go back to the origins of Lupin's relation with the law? Well, it's always a temptation to digress. What on earth did that have to do with what's going on here, for example? Yet even when Lupin interrupts his history lesson to give us the account of how he got the evidence, well, even that account turns out to be a digression at least as far as his astonishing but quite typical deduction is concerned. The narrator is again playing with time, with plot, for neither we nor Ganimard have been presented with the evidence of this detailed conclusion yet. We're shocked by it. It's out of sequence. It disobeys the ordered succession of words as dictated by the grammar of detective fiction. The convention is that we are first presented with the clues, but in scattered and uncertain form, and it's up to the, to the detective to assemble them, sort out their value, and put them together in a deduction or conclusion. That's how the detective shows themselves cleverer than us and wins the game. A game we seem to love to lose, at least in classic detective fiction. The narrator and Lupin are playing with us, as well as with Ganimard here, as the evidence of this astonishing deduction comes only two paragraphs later, in the longest paragraph of the story so far, and which, so Lupin claimed, tires him out with his own ingeniousness, and no doubt the narrator too. It's all very knowing. Now, knowing is a word I've used several times already, which I urge you to think about. It suggests quite a complicated relationship with the reader. Knowingness has a very long tradition in the popular entertainment industry. Think Victorian music hall stars like the drug artist Vesta Tilly. Everyone knew she was a woman, yet she dressed as a man on stage and acted the part very successfully. Or films like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Knowingness is a very self-conscious display of artificiality, often coupled with an interest in helping us explore what that artificiality is. Knowingness is often concerned with helping us realise what are the conventions we've been so trained into that we don't even see them. Conventions that, because we don't see them, foreclose alternatives. This foreclosure and this attempt to open up the foreclosure on the discourses and conventions uh, that we get so used to produces complicated feelings in us. How many of us would agree with Ganimard? Some of it, but probably not the last bit. We need not be ashamed of being taken in by a formidable hoaxer, as long as it's in the privacy of our own reading. I wonder if this is the secret of the pleasure of form. But if we read like a detective and the narrator takes us in, we're delighted and reassured. We admire the writer. Maybe not in an exam, of course, but then that's not in private a public performance, so we feel more like Ganima when we pursue our job as literary detectives with a sense of duty and pride, but also with a continual dread of being taken in by it and fooled in the face of a public that's only too willing to laugh at us. But in private, maybe this is part of the pleasure of successful form, the fact that we fail. It's reassurance that we haven't beaten the writer. 
if we think, I could have done better than that, don't we think we could have got better value for money elsewhere? Maybe that we're getting shoddy goods. Perhaps a big part of the game is the possibility of the narrator's technical failure. When I read Lupin's deduction after not having read the story for some time, temporarily I was enraged because the narrator was not playing the game, I thought. That's really poor writing, I instantly thought. It's just ridiculous. And then, very rapidly, and this is part of the artistry of the succession of words in time, then I realised that the narrator is just cleverer than me. The narrator plays where I plod. I'm the ridiculous one. In spite of all my efforts, in spite of the persistency of my endeavours, I shall never get the better of this particular adversary. Remember, Poe described detective fiction like a draft game, which is, uh, uh, involves the idea of adversaries. And yet, unlike Anima, I like losing, because it proves I have bought a quality product. In the final analysis, my loss in the game is my triumph in real life. I haven't wasted my money. Is that where the pleasure in these formal games lies? Now, I'm not going to go through the whole story in this fashion. I just hope you've gained some ideas of how to approach a formal analysis of a passage or a text as a whole. Remember what clues to look out for. Changes of spatial arrangement often, but not only indicated by verbs. Changes of place, of course, changes of time. I'm sure you can think of a lot more indicators of structural elements. I'm sure you can also think of a lot more ways to discuss text in terms of politics, topicality, ethics, gender. I'm looking forward to continuing this journey with you, reading, writing, suspiciously. Here we've been like detectives finding out mainly how the thing was done, how the writing was created. As for how to investigate writing's motive, what the real crimes are, if any, well, we do and shall amply cover them in other videos on Greenwich Detective Fiction. At the end of this video, enjoy a tiny fragment of music of a kind that Jenny Sapphire might well have sung or danced to in the music hall. Let's think of it as a tribute and reminder of her existence in and brutal removal from the fiction of the red silk scarf.